Let's welcome uh, Tom Potter, talking to us OpenStack on developers. Okay, thank you. Take that away. Sure, thanks. <coughs> Okay, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming along, everyone. I hope you've all been uh, enjoying the conference. Um, so my name is Tim, uh, and I've been working at HP uh, with, with and on OpenStack for nearly five years now, which is a scary amount of time. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about building a personal cloud with OpenStack. So this talk uh, is aimed at a slightly different audience than other OpenStack talks that you may have been with. Uh, and the title kind of gives it away. It's uh, OpenStack for non non developers. So my my big idea is that last year, uh, you know, sometime last year, OpenStack has hit an inflection point uh, where it's no longer the domain of solely developers to be able to install and use it. Uh, so today I'm going to explain how someone who isn't an uh, OpenStack developer, someone who hasn't got uh, like a deep domain knowledge of how OpenStack works. Someone with only basic sysadmin and networking knowledge uh, can install, maintain, and use a small OpenStack system on very modest hardware. Now, this is actually this is super exciting. I find this is super exciting because uh, OpenStack is just a fantastic tool for getting things done, uh, and it's actually pretty easy to run up a big bill on uh, cloud services like Amazon or HP Cloud or whatever. Um, and you know that can be okay if you're you know, you're using it as part of a business or you know, there's money coming in. Uh, but if you're at home uh, and on a budget or whatever, then having a personal cloud uh, that you can use for free is just a fantastic resource. Right, so uh, OpenStack, is a, <laughs> OpenStack is a hot new technology, which is kind of an understatement, really. I mean, there's, there's a lot of hype about it uh, in the tech press and uh, the media, but also among general tech users. Uh, so I was, at the, I was at the dentist the other day and, uh, you know, what, what do you do? And I mentioned something about cloud and cloud services and then had to kind of uh, get, get through 10 minutes of being barraged with questions about what cloud was and, you know, how it worked. And this is from my dentist. Uh, so perhaps I'm showing my age a bit here, but uh, all the energy and excitement around OpenStack really reminds me of Linux itself about 15 years ago. So it's something that's taken the, the IT world in a more, more by storm, um, and it's kind of upset a lot of existing uh, products and companies' plans. And lots of big companies are announcing that they're doing something uh, with OpenStack, um, and they're, you know, all, everyone's joining in, uh, contributing kind of code and money, uh, documentation and what. And of course, uh, everyone's talking about OpenStack at conferences. Um, I counted at least eight uh, OpenStack, eight talks this year uh, that were directly about OpenStack. Right, we're all here at LCA because we, we, like, uh, we love open source and we like building things with it. We're all here because we love tinkering. Um, and I'm going to say that this is one of the best ways uh, to learn about something. Uh, so typically someone like you or I would you know, download the latest version of something, stick it on a machine, see what it does, break it, you know, reinstall it again, um, and then think about how we can use it uh, in our lives at home and at work. And this is what I want to show you to uh, show you what I want to be able to show you how to do with OpenStack. So right now there are uh, about a half dozen or so uh, kind of OpenStack distributions that you can download and start using for free. Uh, Hewlett Packard has HP Helion, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, Rackspace have the Rackspace cl private cloud, and uh, Mirantis has a product called Mirantis OpenStack, uh, just to name a few. So these uh, these products are all great, uh, and but they operate at too high a level. Uh, to do kind of serious tinkering, tinkering and messing around with. So uh, most OpenStack distribution style products are gigantic downloads and you kind of uh, install that image onto, directly onto a server. And I think skipping over that initial install phase kind of cheats you out of uh, an opportunity to learn you know, what all the bits of OpenStack are and how they fit together um, and how they break. So I think you're going to learn a lot more in a build versus a buy. Uh, situation. 
So there's a lot of piecemeal bits and pieces of information available on the internet about installing OpenStack, you know, in the form of blog postings, uh, answers on question, answers on Q&A sites, tutorials and documentation by vendors on getting, you know, various situations working. Uh, but bloggers and people like that usually only document something that they've done, some complicated situation that they've solved or something that they've, they've got working. And they kind of like cut and paste a bit of configuration file and then say what they did. Um, so it's a pretty disjointed experience just kind of coming in and uh, trying to work out what OpenStack is, how to get it working. So what I believe is missing is uh, some basic getting started information for someone who just wants to kick the tires. So what about, what about DevStack? If you've uh, dipped your toes into this OpenStack thing already, uh, you might have heard of DevStack. So DevStack is just a shell script uh, that both documents and installs uh, how, to, how to configure a complete OpenStack system. Um, but it's geared more towards developers, and the, particularly the developers of OpenStack itself. So it really isn't suited at all to production deployments or kind of long-term installs. Uh, my main problems with DevStack is that it doesn't always run to completion successfully because it's under constant development itself and it's got to cope with you know, a lot of many situations. Um, and it's, it doesn't survive a reboot. So if something happens to your server, your DevStack uh, system is, you know, doesn't run, so you've got to run some scripts to get it going again. And it, it assumes you've already got quite a lot of uh, knowledge about existing OpenStack knowledge already before you start. But the good news is you can install OpenStack at home. Uh, what I'm presenting in the next section is a straightforward technique for installing OpenStack uh, on a, at home on a spare PC. So you're not going to need uh, huge amounts of RAM or a um, name brand rack mounted server. Uh, just a regular old desktop machine uh, with a single network card will do. So I, I developed this talk on uh, you know, a five year old HP workstation that I had lying around with only 12 gigs of RAM in it. So we're going to be using uh, vendor-supported packages uh, from a major distribution and kind of standard distribution tools uh, and repositories that are actively being developed and maintained. And at the end, you'll have a working OpenStack service uh, that you can use as a springboard to get started uh, in cloud computing and OpenStack. So there are so many uh, benefits to virtualization and cloud computing that I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to, you're probably sick of hearing about it, so I'm not going to talk about it. I started off writing this talk from the point of view of, hey, you know, this is something cool you might want to try out. Uh, it could be fun. And then it went, went to, wow, this is actually really, really handy. And really, it's in, actually, more than handy, it's insanely useful. Um, and everyone should have one of these. So I won't go back to the buzzword bingo side at the, at the start, but having local access to a free method of... Uh, virtualization and managing virtual machines is, is, a, is a game changer just personally in getting your own work done. You get all the regular benefits of cloud computing. It's, it's cheaper, it's faster, and it's more convenient. And uh, having a, a personal cloud uh, also gives you an extra freedom that you might not have considered before, and that's the, the freedom to experiment. You can do lots of things on a public cloud service, trying out you know, new software and new operating systems. Um, and if you do that on a public cloud as Amazon or HP, uh, the HP public cloud, that's, you know, that's reasonably cheap. It's you know, 30 cents an hour, something like that. But uh, just for personal, it's not really that cheap for personal mucking around. So I, I managed to uh, rack up a $1,000 bill uh, on the HP public cloud just writing this talk, just firing up stuff and forgetting about it and you know, fire up 20 virtual machines and uh, accidentally leave a few of them running. Um, luckily, I've got a free uh, gratis account on the HP Cloud, but if you're at home and you accidentally blow a thousand bucks, you know, I don't know, that's uh, not going to be much fun. It has to be beans and rice for the next, next year or so. <coughs> okay, so what I'm uh, presenting in the next section is the actual technique, straightforward technique for installing OpenStack at home on a spare PC with uh, very modest hardware and networking requirements. Okay, what, what exactly are we going to do? We're going to install the Icehouse release of OpenStack. We're going to install it onto Ubuntu 12.04. Uh, we're, we're going to have it use a range of IP addresses on your, your home network. 
So the particular OpenStack uh, release and operating system I picked here, uh, I just picked it because it worked uh, more or less straight off the bat the first time I tried it. Uh, but other OSs and OpenStack versions are, are certainly doable if you want to put the extra work in. Uh, but for the purposes of getting something up and working, running at home to try out, the kind of exact details, they don't, they don't matter all that much. So the hardware requirements are quite modest. Uh, a spare PC, number one, a spare PC with a reasonable amount of memory. As I said before, I mentioned I developed this talk on a 12 gig machine uh, with, sorry, uh, yeah, a 12, machine with 12 gigs of RAM, but um, eight should be usable as well. Uh, number two, access to a console uh, would be handy uh, if you end up messing up the networking. If you've got a keyboard and a monitor, you can you can plug in. Uh, it'll be useful, or an out of band serial console. Uh, so if you've spent much time messing with Linux, it's actually surprisingly easy to lock yourself out of something uh, by messing with the networking. And I've uh, done it many times, and I'm sure people in the audience have too. Okay, the networking requirements are uh, similarly quite modest. A single NIC uh, and an undisturbed range of IPs on your local home network. So by undisturbed, I mean your DHCP server isn't going to start handing out addresses for them in that range, sorry. And you can most likely uh, change this uh, quite easily in your home router. You just go into the web interface uh, and tweak a few settings. So I've just described on the slide my, home, my network at home. It's pretty standard, 192.168.1.0, uh, class C network, gateway at 1.1, and I've twiddled the DHCP server to hand out addresses in the bottom half of the network, so up to and including .127, which means I've reserved the top half, .128 to 254, uh, for OpenStack. Uh, and in the, in the example here, I'm saying uh, the, so the OpenStack host will live at .1.2. So if you have uh, general knowledge about Linux networking, it's pretty handy. Uh, so DNS, DNS DHCP, uh, most people know, have a basic idea how they work. Uh, ARP, the address resolution protocol, that's um, pretty important for understanding how things put together. And of course, the, uh, how things, how IP routing in, in Linux works, so it's useful to understand for, the, for, the, for our setting up a server. <coughs> so we're going to end up with uh, you know, a standard set of, uh, of uh, OpenStack pieces. Uh, Horizon, the web interface, which is actually really, really good uh, compared to a lot of uh, open source web interfaces. It's quite it's quite, it's quite, it's, it looks quite good. Uh, Nova, uh, the compute service, and Glance, the image service. Neutron for uh, networking uh, to allow your virtual machines to communicate on layer two and layer three levels. Uh, Cinder for block storage, and Keystone kind of ties everything together for authentication. So even though we've left out a bunch of kind of fairly big and important projects, we've still got the essence of OpenStack here, the ability to, the ability to create uh, virtual machines, authentication, persistent storage, networking, and a pretty interface to, to play with it. Okay, so we're going to install OpenStack using Chef and StackForge. So you might not be familiar with Chef. Uh, it's a one of a growing set of automation tools uh, that's basically used to install and configure software on servers. Uh, we're going to be using a set of cookbooks that are part of the Stackbook, oh, sorry, the Stackforge project. Uh, now, the Stackforge project is a big set of tools and repositories uh, used for building infrastructure, and it's what actually what the uh, OpenStack infrastructure team uses to uh, install and uh, run the infrastructure to develop OpenStack itself. So Chef is actually a pretty complicated piece of software, and it can do a lot, but for the purposes of just setting up a single server uh, to mess around with at home, you don't need to know very much about it. Uh, to get started, you just need to create a configuration file, run Chef, and then you can most, mostly just forget about it. Uh, if you're running a, obviously, if you're running a production system or you want to keep up with the very latest version of everything, uh, then you need to think about it a bit more. But uh, just for... To, to creating a single node server, you don't need to know very much about Chef at all. So I'm going to go through a uh, series of command lines here, but don't worry about writing it down or you know, understanding it completely. I've got some pretty detailed instructions of a walkthrough uh, on the wiki page for this project. Uh, it's on GitHub, and the username is Teapot, and the repo name is OS4ND, which stands for OS4 Non-Developers. 
Okay, so here's a, just a very quick overview of ins uh, installing a base operating system for our server. Uh, firstly, we install in Ubuntu 12.04 uh, using a DVD or you know, whatever your favorite method of getting an OS onto a server is. Uh, secondly, we add an extra software repository. Uh, the Ubuntu LTS releases, uh, which is the one we're using, they're not updated very frequently, usually only for security reasons or um, to fix bugs that cause user, uh, data loss or data corruption. So here we're adding the Cloud Archive repository, which is a uh, collection of OpenStack packages that's maintained by the Ubuntu Cloud team. So this repository is updated a lot more frequently than the LTS operating system repository. And then we install a, a slightly more modern kernel, a uh, backport of the next LTS uh, releases kernel, and reboot. Right, so we, install, we can install Chef by just download, downloading a gigantic deb file um, from the vendor, um, installing it using dpackage. And fortunately, uh, as is the case these days with a lot of kind of large, complex pieces of software, they're not, uh, they tend not to be packaged in Ubuntu or Debian. You have to uh, use the vendor package. Uh, secondly, we pull down an umbrella repository from StackForge. Uh, and this is just a... Uh, top-level repository that has a bunch of links and metadata that point to other parts of StackForge. And then we run uh, Chef's a dependency management tool called Berkshell for some reason. Uh, and that kind of just installs, pulls down all the dependent cookbooks uh, and installs them locally. Finally, we create a, a configuration file uh, that describes our, our setup and then run Chef to install and configure OpenStack. And this, this process only takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, it depends mostly on the speed of your network. And uh, that's, that's actually it. Thanks, everyone. No. Now, uh, that's, well, once you finish running Chef, you've, you've got a very basic uh, single node, more or less fully working OpenStack server. OK, here's, a, here's an example of the configuration file that uh, we would feed to Chef. Uh, for a single node install, we don't really describe very much. Uh, I've left off a few things, so it fits mostly on the slide, but uh, they don't matter too much. Um, the, but the essence of it is that it's JSON, and you say what you want and what you don't want on there, and kind of describe a few other um, components, of what your system looks like. Like the, we've just got an IP address there that says which IP address that we're, we're going to listen on. Um, uh, one thing to, to call out is that we're turning on, even though this talk is called for non-developers, we're turning on developer mode, but uh, don't worry about that little inconsistency. And developer mode in this case just uh, t says to, to Chef, uh, don't, don't try and install random passwords, just create well-known passwords, because uh, to configure random passwords for all of Chef, for all of OpenStack is a lot more work, and I don't really want to confuse everyone with that. So uh, well-known passwords are fine for kind of uh, you know, mucking around at home, but obviously if you want to install this at home, you'll need to uh, uh, do that a bit more. Um, that's a bit beyond the scope of the talk, but I want to put that up on the wiki uh, pretty soon, how to do that. All right, so Chef, uh, as I said, creates some well-known passwords and usernames, so we can start poking around with the system more or less immediately. Uh, the commands above set up the environment variables that are used by OpenStack's command line tools. And you can start uh, messing around with the OpenStack command line tools here, or just head over to the web interface and start, start from there. Uh, interestingly, if you run uh, PS or any other kind of performance uh, monitoring tool, uh, it, it, it turns out that a uh, base install of OpenStack with no virtual machines uses about 2 gigs of RAM. So if you've got a 8 gig machine, that still leaves you two, uh, six, 6 gigabytes for virtual machines, which is, which is not bad, just for mucking around. So one last thing before we can say that we're actually finished is that's uh, to hook up the networking. So I'm going to go into lots more detail about the networking in a few moments, but I'm just putting up some command lines here to uh, describe how to connect ETH0 uh, of our PC to one of the virtual Ethernet switches that OpenStack uses. And we're also creating a record for the slice of the external network uh, that we're going to be using on, on our home network. So if you remember back to the start of the talk, uh, my home network was you know, 192.168.1.0. Um, I've reserved the kind of dot 128 up to 254 for use by OpenStack. And the gateway is 1.1. Uh, 1 
And I'm turning off DHCP uh, because we don't really want to have two DHCP servers running on the same network. That uh, usually ends in tears. So uh, networking, networking in OpenStack. It's probably the most complicated part of the system. And it's the piece that I had the most trouble understanding when I was you know, trying to put this all together. And it took me a really long time to get it all together in my head. So hopefully I can uh, save you all a bit of time and explain how it works for you now. Okay, open, open vSwitch, you might have heard about it already. It's uh, one of the major components of OpenStack's networking service. Um, and it's an open source, multi-layer, uh, virtual ethernet switch. So if you think of uh, you know, a physical switch, uh, sorry, if you think of a, a physical ethernet switch with lots of cool security, monitoring and management features, but it's totally, but if it's totally in software and open source, um, then that's basically what open vSwitch is. After we've run Chef and configured our network, uh, as described previously, um, the, we end up with two virtual switches on our server. Uh, the first is called BR Int, which, uh, stands, which is the switch for the OpenStack integration network. It's not internal, um, which is confusing. It's integration. Uh, and this is the switch that the virtual machines get plugged into, and also OpenStack's uh, DHCP and some other internal services that are all connected together on the internal, so go, on the integration bridge. And BREX is the switch that represents our external network, and that uh, um, is connected to our home network. So this is what networking looks like uh, after Chef is finished on our Chef is completed on our host. Uh, there are the two virtual network switches that I just mentioned: uh, BRint for integration and BREX for external access. Yeah, unfortunately, these uh, interfaces are confused. Sorry, OpenV switch goes and creates uh, some ports and interfaces to, to connect to these. Uh, uh, these switches, but unfortunately they're named, they're all the port, the switch, and the interface are all given the same name as the switch itself. So if you're talking about BREX, then you have to kind of figure out whether you're talking about, you know, which bit you're talking about. Usually it's obvious, but uh, something to not get confused about. And also notice we've got the, the ETH0 physical network interface, the only physical part of the system just down there on the bottom left there. Okay, let's look at what happens uh, when the networking, to the networking when some virtual machines are created. So when a virtual machine is created, it's given a virtual port on BR int and gets plugged in, and that appears as ETH0 on the virtual machine. Uh, notice how there's no connection between the BR int and the BREX bridges at the moment. So at this stage, uh, virtual machines can only communicate with each other, and they don't have access to anything outside the host. Uh, to allow virtual machines to communicate with the outside world, uh, we need to link the two uh, virtual switches together using a router, a virtual router, surprisingly. Uh, so the router operates at the uh, level three layer, that is the IP address level. Uh, for the most part, the Open V switch uh, bridges operate at the layer two level, the MAC address level. So if we add a virtual router uh, between the BR int and BREX bridges, then IP packets can flow uh, between virtual machines uh, to the outside world. And notice we also we actually also need to plug in ETH0 into well, in a virtual sense, of course, uh, into BREX. And that was one of the commands on the, on the previous slide was was telling OpenV switch to plug the physical port into the virtual switch. Okay, so to, just to uh, demonstrate you know, how to hook up the networking, I'm going to have a quick demo using a, a virtual machine. I didn't want to press my luck and try with native networking, so I'm, I've created a virtual machine on the laptop here. I'm just going to give you a quick demo of, uh, um, yeah, of how, to, how to do this initial networking setup. Right, so I'm just going to create and configure an unprivileged user to do, to, to do this. Uh, in the same way that you don't do everything as root on your, uh, on your Linux box, it's, it's not a good idea to do stuff uh, in OpenStack as the admin user. So I'm just going to uh, uh, follow the instructions here. I'm just uh, in the web interface, create a, a project or a tenant called demo. Uh, I'm going to create a user and then I'm going to sign out. So let's see how this goes. Woo! Uh, that's not what I... Is that what I wanted? Uh, I think I might have messed up my... 
Oh, that's annoying. Okay. Right, so I was just going to log in as admin, admin. Uh, I was going to zip on down to the identity panel, projects, create, create a demo user, sorry, a demo project. Let's see, a 315 demo. Okay, and I'm going to create a demo user. Demo, oops. Okay, and it's going to be a member of the demo project or tenant. Okay, user demo was successfully created. I'm going to sign out. Okay, that was easy. All right, the next step, um, I'm, I actually glossed over a little bit of how, exactly how the networking works uh, in, in OpenStack. So in the previous slides, you might have got the impression that all the VMs connected to uh, the BR int switch can talk to each other. So that's, that's not the case. Uh, Linux, some Linux networking tricks are used to isolate the different users from each other um, by using uh, some, some private networks. So we need to create a, a private network for our demo user inside OpenStack. And I'm just going to go through the instructions here and create a uh, layer 2 and a layer 3 uh, network uh, with, with an with a address up there. So to do this, we log in to, we log in as the demo user. I'm going to go to network. I am going to create a network. Notice we've, uh, we can see the public net here. Um, that's the slice of our external home network. I'm going to call the demo net, demo net. I'm going to create a demo subnet, which has, uh, which has, sorry, which has that, you know, that 10.0 uh, address. And I'm going to turn on DHCP and I'm going to give it some name servers. I'm just going to point it at Google's ones because it's easy. Okay, so that is create, oops. Okay, so that is creating a network for the demo user that only the demo accounts virtual machines can talk on. Okay, now remember we need, we need to link the internal network and the external, sorry, the integration network and the external network together with the router. So I'm going to go through the instructions here to create a uh, demo router. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'll do that right now. That's quite quick. So yes, log, still logged in as the demo user. I'm just going to pop down to router here. Create, uh, create a router, demo router. Okay, and now I'm going to set the one half of the router to point at our, the forwarding, sorry, the forwarding gateway I'm going to set to point at the public net because we want all packets coming into our gateway to go out to the public network or the internet or your home network. And we also need to hook up another part, the other half of the router. I'm going to add, I'm going to add the demo network to the other side of the router. So we've now got two sides of the router, one on the internal side, one on the external side. And that's all nice and happy. Okay, I'm just going to uh, create a virtual machine and show that packets can go from the virtual machine out to the home, sorry, out onto your home network, in this case the conference network, and then back again. Okay, I'm just going to follow the instructions here. Right, so I'll go to Compute Instances. I'm going to launch an instance. I'm going to call it Demo. Uh, I'm not going to call it Demo Router. Thank you, Autocomplete. Um, I'm going to give it a, a, one of the, one of the uh, Chef installs, a kind of testing uh, virtual machine image here. So I'm going to run that. Uh, and I'm going to connect the virtual machine up to our little private network and launch. Okay, now we make a sacrifice to the demo gods and hope this uh, comes up. It has every time I've, every time I've tested it, it has. Oh, excellent. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go to the console. Uh, so we should be seeing uh, the standard Linux kernel boot up messages here. And in a few seconds, as if by magic, uh, we'll get a login prompt. How good is that? Uh, so this is the... Uh, oops. Come on. 
Okay, I'm just going to log in using the uh, credentials that are up here. Yeah, it's handy, isn't it? <laughs> more and more systems should do that, I think. Okay. Oh. Uh. Okay, right. So if we, this is our, on our, the console of a virtual machine, it should be connected up to, uh, it should be have an address in the 10 range on our private network. And let's see whether we can head out to our router and back again. Okay, well, we will we'll just pretend that worked, okay? I won't. <laughs> I won't tell anyone it didn't work if you don't. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, no, I had that. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, had, to, I, had, to, yeah, I had to do this in virtual box before I started. But okay. Okay, so I know. Okay, right. Uh, 216.83. <laughs> oh, okay, look, look. I, I, I'm not going to have enough time to do all this, but... This basically works, trust me. Um, you can't connect from the conference network. Well, you can, you can send ping packets to Google's 8.8.8.8 name server, but you can't get requests back. So you just need to, if I go back to my network configuration, I should say use the conference name servers, which are 130. something. Um, so yeah, that was, I didn't, uh, I uh, didn't remember that I had to deviate from my script <laughs> and install different name servers, but yeah, although you can ping, yeah, anyway. Yeah, you should, you should, but um, uh, I have only got another 10 minutes to get through the rest of this, so. Um, right, so I've already done this. Uh, I've logged into the console with the credentials. I have shown slash not shown, the networking works. Um, and VMs, don't forget, the VMs are by the same tenant, can see each other at the layer two level if they're on the same network. And virtual machines from different tenants are completely isolated and they can't communicate with each other at all, with each other at all. Okay, this next test demo should work because I'm not using uh, our names. I'm going to uh, create a floating IP and attach it to the virtual machine. So uh, if, just instances. Right, so what we're doing is we're actually Yeah, so what we are what, what we're doing here is we're saying to OpenStack, please give me an IP, please allocate me an IP address from my home network and assign it to a virtual machine. So public net will be on 192.168, but the demo is a bit different because it's um, running locally. So it's given me a, a floating IP. And I should, I'll associate that with uh, my demo virtual machine. Okay, so uh, the demo virtual machine here has two IP addresses, one on the demo network and another one on the external network. And if I ping, I'll put a bit more of this on the screen for you. Right, if I ping uh, 10.0.2.133, that should, uh, that's me talking to the virtual machine using a floating IP address through the router. Okay, we'll just get back to, fortunately, we've uh, got to zip through the next bit. Okay, networking. I'm going to go over it yet again. Uh, so this is what um, the networking looks like with some IP addresses attached. Uh, we've got two virtual machines, dot three and dot four. Uh, if dot three wants to talk to dot four, it'll do it in the same way that a physical machine would. Uh, dot three sends out an ARP request. It says, hello, um, I'm dot three. Uh, I'm looking for the MAC address of dot four. And dot four will receive that broadcast request and say, hello, I'm dot four. My MAC address is whatever. And then the two virtual machines can communicate with each other. For packets heading out, so if you wanted to ping, uh, you wanted to download some software or whatever from your virtual machine, uh, this process is quite similar. Uh, dot three knows that it needs to send out packets through the gateway, dot one. So it would send out an ARP request and find the MAC address of dot one. Um, and then once the packet hits the router, some source NAT happens, and it rewrites the uh, the out sorry the source address of that packet to be 
the address of the OpenStack host, which was 1.2 in our example, and the packet zips out the internet and comes back again. For public IP addresses, the flow is pretty similar, uh, except in this case, where the packet goes out to the router, um, the, in the source NAT stage, the router um, changes the outgoing IP address to be the floating IP address, which in the example is 1.128. Uh, and then it goes out to the, to the internet. Packets coming back in will be addressed to 1.128. So uh, the router needs to act as a proxy ARP uh, server, so it will it knows that it needs to respond to ARP request for itself, but also for dot one twenty eight and other IP addresses that it's responsible for. So on ETH zero, if someone asks for the layer two uh, MAC address of dot one twenty eight, our dot two server will respond in, by proxy for it, and that's how we can send packets. Uh, out and back again, and I mean, obviously, floating IPs allow uh, incoming connections to be made to virtual machines, which is the which is the uh, thing. So you can set up an open if you set up an OpenStack server at home um, by using floating IPs. You can have other users on your network uh, connect to services on your virtual machine. So you might want to set up a, a Minecraft server or a web server or something that's accessible on your local network. That's what we'd use floating IPs for. All right, so we've got a uh, basic OpenStack system. We can boot virtual machines, talk to the internet, accept incoming connections using floating IP addresses. So I'm just going to go over a few bits and pieces uh, to help you get more out of the system. Okay, operating your cloud. Um, obviously, these things need a little bit of uh, maintenance and kind of day-to-day -day, uh, troubleshooting sometimes. So OpenStack is, it's not, you know, it's not a black box, uh, although it might be a, a collection of black boxes, but uh, it's not. It's, um, it's just a collection of, of REST interfaces, and these REST interfaces are in front of lots of Linux technologies that you might already have, uh, you know, familiarity with. So for Nova, I mean, this is a bit of an oversimplification, so sorry, Michael. Um, Nova is just a REST interface in front of, in front of libvirt. Uh, Keystone, uh, you know, it's a REST interface that interacts with MySQL or you know, some other backend that perform, can perform authentication. Um, Cinder, uh, for a, just a local machine, uh, we can use LVM2. Uh, uh, Glance uh, just kind of allows us to read and write disk files, you know, fundamentally. And Neutron uh, is a REST interface in front of uh, again, a bit of an over, oversimplification. It's in, in front of IP tables, Open vSwitch, and you know, a bunch of other Linux technologies that you, uh, you probably already have heard a lot about. So uh, troubleshooting your little, your little server. So what do you do you know, when you uh, find something that goes wrong? You look in the log file. What's the second thing you do? You poke around in the configuration file to see if it's you know, not configured the way you thought it was. What's the third thing you do? You go search on Stack Overflow, <laughs> but, but I mean it's, it's because open because the individual components of OpenStack are you know in front uh, you know in front of an underlying resource. You troubleshoot the underlying resource. Networking is probably the only really tricky uh, thing to worry about. Um, it uses a few projects that I guess your average system admin might not have seen so much. Uh, IP uh, network namespaces, something I hadn't actually heard about until I started messing uh, with OpenStack. Um, that's the technology that allows uh, much in the way uh, control groups and Docker kind of allows process isolation and net network namespaces allow network namespace isolation. Um, and Open vSwitch, uh, it, it's got a bunch of command line tools that you can use uh, to kind of poke around at what's going on. Okay, back, back to Chef. Uh, so at some stage, if you want to uh, kind of mess with the configuration of your, uh, your server, you might, want to, uh, you might want to change some part of Nova. Um, so the very, very uh, simplified process of doing this is you uh, work at what configuration file you want to change, say it's nova.conf, there will be a template file somewhere uh, in your cookbooks that you've downloaded called nova.conf.eib. You take a look at that file, uh, work out you know, what template variable you want to change, and then add that to your configuration file and rerun Chef. And Chef will rewrite 
that nova.conf file and then restart the right services so that things will start working again. So for example, uh, if you, what I'm running right now, I'm running uh, OpenStack inside a virtual box VM. Uh, so you can't run, well, apart from the fact that it's a Mac and it doesn't do KVM, if you're running on Linux, you can't run KVM in KVM um, unless prior arrangements with management have been made. Um, you can run QEMU in KVM though. So you're running QEMU in QEMU, which is a bit slow. But nonetheless, that's, that's a useful thing to do. So it turns out that Nova uh, has a little configuration parameter that you can change. Uh, so you change the vert type from KVM to QEMU, and by poking around in the template file, uh, you can see that the attribute, the JSON variable you're looking at is in a dictionary called OpenStack Compute libvert vert type. So you add that to our JSON file, rerun chef, and everything's good. Okay, again, a bit of oversimplification, but this is the general idea. So this is what this would look like. Uh, this is the configuration file I use to build a virtual OpenStack on VirtualBox. So we, you probably can't remember the previous JSON file, but uh, we've just added, I've just added OpenStack compute libvert vert type and set it to QEMU. Okay, uh, to start off with uh, virtual, sorry, uh, Open uh, Chef, right? So Chef, when Chef installs uh, OpenStack for you, it gives you a very one very small image that's basically only using views for testing. So to make your you know little home OpenStack server more useful, you need to suck down and install some more images. Uh, there are a couple of places you can do that. Um, Ubuntu has a has a site, and Red Hat has a site too, which has got links to other images. So you just download a couple of hundred megabytes of, of disk image and then run Glance. Uh, image create to import that, or you can do that through the web interface as well, that's pretty easy. Okay, block storage. Uh, for a single node OpenStack server, we can use LVM. Uh, so if, you had, if you've got an extra disk in your server, or if you had the foresight to partition it uh, with LVM beforehand, um, you can configure Cinder, the block servers, the block storage service to use LVM, a volume group. So there's just some commands on the slide there of uh, how to create an LVM volume group uh, called Cinder Volumes, and that's kind of standard stuff if you've done LVM before. So using uh, Cinder gives us persistent storage for our virtual machines, uh, which we can do snapshots and back backups with. You can actually use NFS uh, if you enjoy uh, working with NFS, but not many people do. Uh, okay, finally, uh, multi-node setup. I haven't considered it in this presentation. I wouldn't think that too many people would have the resources lying around at home uh, to uh, install a multi-node situation, but if you do some chef tricks, um, you kind of split the services into some control node and some compute-only services, and you install them on different nodes. But the interesting thing to note, uh, multi-node networking is a bit more complicated. Uh, OpenStack creates a third virtual switch called BRTUN, and that it creates then creates a mesh between each compute node so they can all talk to each other. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a lot of okay, so there's a lot of islands of information about OpenStack in the form of blog posts, Q and A sites, uh, vendor tutorials, and documentation. But I don't think there's not a huge amount on really basic getting started stuff. So I hope in the previous 45 minutes uh, you've seen how straightforward it is to just install a server and start using with it. Sorry, and start using it. So if you're going to only remember one thing from this talk, it's, just, it's this: in 2015, you don't need to be a developer to install and use OpenStack effectively. But because you're here at LCA, uh, you're a hacker and a maker and a tinkerer, and you learn things by uh, you know, installing it and trying it out and making mistakes. And once you're over that kind of initial hump, learning, the initial hump in the learning curve, you can move forward and start uh, you're discovering more about how OpenStack works. So installing OpenStack isn't an end in itself in the same way that installing Linux or Apache or you know, uh, MySQL isn't an end in itself. OpenStack is just a tool. And these tools you can use to solve problems and build solutions. So you, you might want to install an OpenStack server at work uh, for building and testing a software uh, but whatever you do, realize that OpenStack can be used in the small as well as in the large, and it can allow you to cheaply and freely experiment with you know, whatever the latest thing is. 
But thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, my email address is up there if you want to uh, say hi or have any questions. And don't forget the wiki link is also up there as well for a more detailed walkthrough. Thanks very much. We have some time for some questions if you've got a slide. Uh, the, the networking you just set up, is there a reason it use, we're doing two bridges with a router instead of just connecting the VMs directly to BREX? I think that's uh, just the way... Uh, it's, I think you probably can configure OpenStack just to use one, but the way the Stackforge cookbooks have, done, have uh, implemented it is to have two bridges uh, so you can... It, if you want to move to a larger install or do some more tricky things, it's easier to have two bridges, and they're virtual and they're free, effectively, so... Hey. Just, uh, I've got a few questions, hopefully some of them are very quick. Uh, any particular reason why you're using Precise instead of Trusty for your setup? Uh, um, there was a problem with Chef and Trusty, some interaction right. that, you know, I could have spent days fixing, but I... <laughs> But it, it may be fixed now, but... Yeah, and just what, what about Swift? It, was there a particular reason that it couldn't be included due to the constraints of the environment? Oh, no, not, not so much an environment. It's just I didn't think that would be something that someone at home would necessarily want to use. Um, at, as, as a home user, I'm, I'm just assume, kind of assuming your use case would be running virtual machines and services and that kind of thing. So there's no reason why you can't do Swift as well. So it could be deployed on their hardware? Yeah, oh, yeah definitely. And last one, um, proxy up in the Neutron Gateway, is that all automated by the adding of the floating IP process? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And the um, there's this horrible, horrible set of IP tables rules that gets done on your behalf, which you probably don't want to look at, but and it works. And does all of that run on the host system, not on the not in a separate networking in router instance or something? Oh, no, like it's, all, it's all on the host system and it's all virtual inside, you know, inside Linux and, you know, whatever IP table rules, so you don't need anything else. <laughs> Almost there. <clears throat> Long way away. Um, just a quick question about ARP um, security and uh, network isolation. Uh, what if, you know, I'm running an untrusted environment and what if somebody changes the MAC address, somebody changes the IP address, what kind of protection is there? Thank you. Uh, you yeah, um, that's kind of beyond the scope of what I'm considering here. Um, I, would, I don't know the answer. I'd probably go and find someone else who knows more about, about uh, Neutron and ask them the question. Sorry. Um, we have time for one more question, I think. Um, with the console, that was a text-based console. Is that uh, the console? Is it graphical or is it just text? Uh, it is. Uh, it's like a, it was basically if you have a Windows embedded. server, would it still give you the a console? Yeah, it's it's an embedded VNC client which talks to a VNC server in QEMU. So I'm not sure whether that's graphical or text. It's probably more more text, more graphical than text, but it's it's VNC. Hi. Um, would it be possible to have a quick look at the IP config of the host virtual machine that you were running that in? I'm just interested to see whether oh, sure. one of those, those virtual interfaces surface themselves. Ah, um, let me get rid of this guy. Uh, let's save. Okay, the, of the virtual machine, okay. Um, I'll see if I can get this done quickly, otherwise you might have to talk to me afterwards. The host. Oh, the host. Ah, right, sorry. I think the answer might be no. <laughs> ah, keyboard weirdness. Um, right, yeah. Um, I can go through some of the, I understand some of this. I can go through it with you. It's probably doesn't, I probably can't tell it to you in 30 seconds, but come see me after. It's a bit complicated, is the answer. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks again, everyone. Thank you.
Tom Potter, thank you very much. I'll see how uh, more spoken. Cool. Thank you. The organizers. Cool. Thanks.